and a conviction that in the church uh, and in our society today, we need um, some solidity. We need to come back to and understand that there are some things which are right. There are some things which are wrong. And uh, we need to, as God's people, take a stand for the things which are right and against the things which are wrong and which our culture is just uh, uh, plunging headlong into. Uh, I tell you, I, I said every opportunity I get, um, I'm giving this message. I even went so far as to create an opportunity uh, a few weeks ago. Um, have you ever heard of a preacher who goes on vacation? And of course, when you're the preacher and you take vacation, uh, Robert, you know this. You can't stay home and worship with the home congregation because uh, they wonder why you're out there in the pew instead of up in the pulpit preaching. So I always go visit uh, with a different friend or something, uh, uh, somebody I know who's preaching nearby. Well, I was out at Olney, and uh, Scott Clark and I had uh, talked about uh, me visiting out there, and I said, you never know, I may even preach for you. He said, all right, if you've got a real barn burner, you just come on and preach. And and I got there that Sunday morning, <laughs> and he said, well, do you want to preach? And I said, yes, I do. I really do. So uh, I just, I was happy to have that opportunity, um, and, and several, it seems like, this summer where I can speak on this particular message. We were very happy to have Robert come and start our summer series this year. Uh, and he had called me on the phone and, and told me what the theme was for your congregational summer series, what the church needs to hear. Well, um, I believe that the church needs to hear crystal clear teaching about right and wrong. Uh, we do. Christians living in America today are floating in a cultural ocean which is gray in color. In fact, I would say that our nation's culture, if, if, if our nation had a favorite color, that color would be gray. There's just a lack of desire to say this is absolutely right and this is absolutely wrong. But some of the gray heads in here remember that there was a time when there were some things absolutely right and there were some things absolutely wrong. And our children these days, your children, grandchildren, maybe great-grandchildren, need to come back to an understanding from the Word of God that there are things which are absolutely right and some things which are absolutely wrong. Now, I did preach this sermon some, uh, in one place in particular recently, and after I finished, a guy came up to me and said, that's the way it is with you, it's just, it's just all black and white, there's not any gray area. Well, now, I'm not stupid. I know that there are matters of opinion and things that, uh, that uh, you could make different decisions regarding, but there are some things that are just crystal clear from the Word of God, and those are the things that I want to make clear to us tonight. The evil one has so successfully deceived and darkened people's understanding when it comes to these matters, that today even followers of Jesus are somewhat confused. But I'll say to you and me that we need not live in confusion. What we need to do is hear, Thus saith the Lord from the living and enduring Word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord does what? It stands forever. The word of the Lord stands forever, and this is the word which was preached to you, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 
and 25. The Bible says that some things are right and other things are wrong. For example, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7, the Apostle John writes there, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, even as Jesus is righteous. What did he say? He said, the one who does what is right is righteous, even as Jesus is righteous. And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 25, kind of the other side of the coin, anyone who does what is wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. So the Scripture affirms that there are some things which are right and other things which are wrong. In fact, let me go so far as to say this. Some things are right and can never be wrong, and there are some things which are wrong, and try as hard as culture may to say that it's right, it can never be right. What do you call those things that are 100% wrong or 100% right? Well, again, it's a word that isn't very popular in our culture today, but you call those things absolutes absolutes the culture that we live in enjoys the thought of relativism everything's relative if I think it's okay well then for me it is okay well but what if I disagree with that well then for you it's not alright but for me it is alright that's relativism thinking. Well, I just have two points to this message, and I don't know if we have any note takers among us, but if you are taking notes, I hope your pen, your hand works quickly. Otherwise, just get the tape or the CD or however it is that you record these. Maybe go online and re-listen. Point number one. It is right. It is right. It is right to worship the Lord your God in spirit and in truth and to serve Him only. Isn't that right? Doesn't the Bible say that that is something that a Christian is to do? Worship the Lord your God in spirit and in truth and serve Him only. Matthew chapter 4 verse 10 and John chapter 4 verse 24. It is right, and we need to be reminded of this, it is right to be honest, to tell the truth, to speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4 verse 25 says that. Jesus said it this way, let your yes be yes and your no be no in Matthew chapter 5 verse 37. In other words, if you intend to do what someone's asking you to do, then say yes. But so, we've all kind of done this, though, in the past at times. When someone asks us to do something and we really don't intend to, but we don't want to disappoint them, we kind of say, oh, okay, and then we don't follow through. Jesus said, hey, how about just being honest? Just let your yes be yes, fulfill your commitment, and if you don't intend to, just say no. You know, they can deal with it. Tell the truth. It is right to practice the golden rule, to treat others the way we would have them treat us. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. It is right, church, to feed the hungry, to give water to the thirsty, to care for strangers, to clothe the poor, to look after the sick, and to visit people in prison, Jesus said in Matthew 25, verses 35 and 36. It is right to love your enemies, Luke chapter 6 verse 27 says. It is right to help people who have been hurt and abused. That's what the story of the Good Samaritan is all about. Here's this man on the side of the road. What's happened? He's been hurt. He's been abused. He's been robbed and left for dead on the side of the road. And here you've got a priest and a Levite, two religious guys, and they pass by on the other side because they've got things to do and this, that, and the other. But here comes the, the Samaritan considered to be a dog by the Jewish people. And he takes care of the wounded man, the abused man, puts him on his own donkey, takes him to an inn and, and uh, pays for his stay there. And Jesus said what? Go and do likewise. 
go and do the same. That was the application Jesus made. In other words, it's right to take care of people who have been abused and who have been hurt. It is right to keep on praying and to pray always. Jesus taught a parable in Luke chapter 18 so that His followers would pray and not give up. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. And it is right for us to pray, especially for those who are in positions of authority, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It is right to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Matthew 22, verses 37 and 38. It is right to pay taxes, to render to Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and to render to God that which belongs to God, that which bears the image of God. You remember the illustration Jesus used whenever they came to him and asked him, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? He said, let me see a coin, a denarius, and they handed him this coin, and he said, whose image is on this coin? And they said, well, that's Caesar's. And he said, well, then give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But who bears the image of God? Jesus didn't say that, but he was, he was conveying the same message. He said, give to God what is created in His image, yourself, ourselves, right? Luke chapter 20, verses 22 to 25, and Romans 13, verse 7. It is right to submit to governing authorities. According to Paul in Romans 13, 1, and Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Peter said that we are to um, fear God, to love the brotherhood of believers, and to honor the king. And when Peter wrote that, do you know who his king was? It was Nero, and in the words of Richard Rogers who was a great preacher, Nero was the lowest toad that ever squatted on any throne. <laughs> Isn't that good? But that's the truth. And he's, he had the nerve, by the Holy Spirit, of course, to write that we are to submit to governing authorities. It is right for you and me as God's people to bear these qualities, love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It may not be popular in our culture today, but I'll tell you the Bible says that it is right for wives to submit to and respect their husbands in Ephesians 5, verses 22 and 33. And it is right for husbands to love our wives as Christ loved the church in Ephesians 5, verse 25. It is right for children to obey their parents in the Lord, Ephesians 6, verse 1. In fact, that verse says, it, it actually says it. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It is right for fathers not to exasperate our children, but to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Ephesians 6, verse 4. It is right if you are employed to work for your employer as though you are working for the Lord and not for men. Now that's what the Bible says in Colossians 3, verse 23. And if you are the employer, the Bible says something to you too. It says, for those who employ, it is right that you provide what is right and fair because you know that you too have a master who is in heaven. Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. It is right, according to Colossians 3, verse 13, for us to forgive as the Lord forgave us. And it is right, 
Again, this goes in the face of culture today. For people to be pure, the Bible word is sanctified. And to avoid fornication or sexual immorality. You might want to put your eyes on this next passage. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 and 5. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 four and five. Are we there? First Thessalonians four verse three. For this is the will of God. Let me ask you a question. Do you have to guess what the will of God is that is about to be told here in this verse? You don't have to wonder. It's not a gray area. There's no question mark. For this is the will of God. We would have to have help to miss that this is the will of God. Paul said, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And yet we live in a society where the rule of the day is do whatever you want sexually, with whomever you want, however often you want. Who cares if it destroys families, breaks up marriages? But the Bible says it is right for us to be pure, to be sanctified, to avoid sexual immorality, fornication. It is right to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. It is right, biblically, to treat older men as fathers, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity, 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 and 2. It is right to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share, and in this way you will treasure up for yourselves a firm foundation for the coming age so that you may take hold of the life that is truly life. And that's 1 Timothy 6, verses 18 and 19. It is right to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. Titus 2 verse 12. It is right, according to the book of Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4, to keep the marriage bed pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. It is right to care for widows and for orphans in their distress and to keep ourselves from being polluted by the world. James 1, verse 27. It is right to live in humility and not self-pride. In other words, to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Anybody remember when we used to say, Lord willing, Lord willing. James 4, verse 15. It is right to rid ourselves of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind, and like newborn babies, to crave the pure spiritual milk of God's Word. 1 Peter 2, verses 1 and 2. It is right to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may lift us up in due time, to cast all our anxiety on Him, because He cares for us. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. And it is right if we have material possessions. Listen to this one. If we have material possessions and a fellow Christian is in need, it is right to have pity on them and to love them with actions, not just in words. In other words, do something for them. 1 John 3, verses 17 and 18. And I'll tell you tonight, it is right to fight the good fight of the faith. And that is what I am doing here tonight. I love the church of my Lord. 
and I want to stand for something. You've heard the old saying that if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And I'm telling you, we live in a crumbling society that is absolutely falling for anything and everything, and I am one preacher who's going to stand for something. Point number two. I bet you can guess what it is. It is wrong. It's wrong to harbor anger and unforgiveness towards someone. Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, settle matters quickly with your adversary and be reconciled to your brother on the way. Matthew 5, verse 21. It is wrong to commit adultery. In fact, Jesus said it is wrong still to look with lust at someone who is not your spouse because that is committing adultery in your heart. Matthew 5 verse 29. And do we not live in a society where anyone with a smartphone or with a laptop computer can access images there for nothing, no other purpose than to lead a person into lust. It is wrong to divorce, said Jesus, except for marital unfaithfulness, Matthew 5 verse 32. It is wrong to store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, and not to store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal, Matthew 6, 19 and 20. It is wrong to be consumed with worry, Matthew 6, 25. Why? Because your heavenly Father knows what you need. He feeds the birds. He puts flowers in the fields. What we need to do is seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness and God will take care of all those other things for us. It's wrong to be a hypocrite. To pretend like we are sincere followers of Jesus but to really on the inside be insincere. Seven times in Matthew 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Seven times. It is wrong to place stumbling blocks in front of others. In fact, Jesus said it would be better to have a thousand pound millstone hung around our necks and tossed into the depths of the sea than to cause one of his little ones to sin. Luke 17, verses 1 and 2. And if you would just like a list of things that not only are wrong, but that very accurately show our current society, all you have to do is read Romans, the first chapter, verses 18 through the end. And I know this church has been studying Romans, haven't you? I think uh, there have been some sermons preached on Romans here. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Romans 1 verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. This is where our society is. Claiming to be wise. Oh, Darwin, he was wise, wasn't he? There's no such thing as a God. There's, there are no such things as miracles. Everything is billions and billions of years old and uh, 
People claim to be wise. And so in doing that, verse 23, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. And because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary in nature. What is that? Lesbianism. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. What is that? Homosexuality among men. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now, folks, I was raised in the 70s. I know I look older than that. I was born in 68. That makes me 45. You do the math. I know I look older. It's the mileage. It's not the years. Okay? Never, never in my wildest dreams did I ever think as a kid growing up that I, I, I couldn't have comprehended somebody coming up with a phrase, same-sex marriage. Could you? No, you could not have, nor could I. And... Yet here we are. But the Lord's people, we have to stand on Romans chapter 1 and say, this is wrong. It is wrong for a man to be with a man when God intended a man to be with a woman. It is wrong for a woman to be with a woman when God intended for a woman to be with a man. I've said before, and I, I have to be careful with this, it is true on one level, it is, it, and, and I want to stick with just that it's true on this level. I can prove to you that homosexuality is wrong without opening the Bible, based on the principle, if everyone did it. If everyone were homosexual, the world would cease to exist in a generation. That in itself says there's something wrong with this. But yet we have the Bible that says uh, this is against the will of God. Let me go on and finish this message. It is wrong to be sexually immoral, to idolize anything above God, to commit adultery, to engage in prostitution homosexual activity, to steal, to be greedy, to be a drunkard, to slander, or to be a swindler. Such will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. Now, gratefully, Paul does say, such were some of you. So I know that repentance can happen from those things, but still, such will not inherit the kingdom of God. That makes it wrong. Crystal clear. Paul said in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. And then listen to him. He says, and the like. Do you know what and the like means? It means the list could go on. I'm just stopping here because... 
because I'm stopping. <laughs> the list could go on. Paul says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom. Does that, doesn't that make it wrong? That we can't be in the kingdom of God if that's our lifestyle. It's wrong to live with anger and rage and malice, slander, filthy language on our lips, Colossians 3, verses 8 and 9. Hey, don't think that it's a little thing to tell a dirty joke. It's wrong in the sight of God. Filthy language on our lips. It's wrong to be lazy, to be idle, to be busybodies. I wonder if any of the old timers remember preachers who used to preach from 2 Thessalonians 3. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. For when we were with you, we gave you this rule. Anybody remember the rule that Paul gave in 2 Thessalonians? If a man will not work, neither let him what? Neither let him eat. Now the Bible still says that. That it's wrong to let a capable person sit around and just be lazy and live off of the generosity of others, whether that be the federal government or the church or whatever. We can't condone what God condemns. I hope that by the preaching tonight you are being reconvinced that there is indeed such a thing as right and wrong. And I tell you, you and I sadly live in a culture that fits the words of Isaiah 5 verse 20. If you don't have Isaiah 5 verse 20 underlined in your Bible, I hope you'll underline it. Because I don't think there are more appropriate words in the Scripture which describe America today. Woe to those, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Do we not live in an upside down society? that calls darkness light and light darkness, that calls good evil and evil good. I mean, oh, it's a terrible thing for a school teacher to have a Bible sitting on her desk. That's just awful. They, she might or he might corrupt the children. But yet, I'll tell you, when you and I live in a country which will put you in prison for 20 years minimum, for killing a spotted owl because it is an endangered species and then congratulate a woman and pat her on the back and say that was a responsible decision to kill your unborn child. Friends, what can you say other than that is calling evil good and good evil? Putting darkness for light and light for darkness and putting bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I don't know what else you could call it. And as Christians, you and I must. I say we must fight the good fight of the faith. We must be God's righteous sons and daughters, clearly holding up the torch of truth so that others too may be rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God's dear Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God bless the church. God bless preachers who stand on the Word of God. And even though it is not popular in our culture to preach these things, and oftentimes, I guarantee you, I feel like Jeremiah. And I know preachers today who, who feel as though uh, we're standing alone sometimes. And I'll say to the churches, to the Christians who back us up and who say, we're with you, we are 100% behind you, thank you, God bless you, because you would be surprised probably to know that there are some, even among us, who will take us to task when we sit down and all we've done is preach the Word of God. Now, it is customary 
for us to have an invitation at the close of a sermon. And it's our privilege to be able to offer you the biblical response. You know, this, this recently, has it's just thrilled me to tell my home congregation at the end of a sermon, hey, would you like to know how to become a Christian? If you were to ask me tonight, how do I become a Christian? I don't have to tell you to say a sinner's prayer and to ask the Lord Jesus to come into your heart and all of that kind of thing because you won't find that in the New Testament. I'll tell you what you will find. If you want to be forgiven of your sins, and I can just open my Bible and show it right to you, just read Acts the second chapter, the 38th verse. Because people were asking Peter on the day of Pentecost, what should we do? And if that's the question you're asking tonight, the answer is what Peter told them 2,000 years ago. Repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you too will receive the Holy Spirit. And so tonight, it makes me very happy to be among the people of God who just turn the Bible around and say, here's the answer right out of the Scripture. And if you're tonight ready to give your life to Jesus in repentance and faith and baptism, we'd love to help you obey the gospel. Or if there's something in your life maybe you need prayer for regarding, uh, just come let us know. We don't know what's happening in your life. This church family wants to serve you the best we can by praying for you and praying with you. Let's be standing and singing. If anyone needs to respond, just step to the front. Uh,